Our message is entitled Fighting for Your Life. As I was reflecting on it, um, as I sat here this morning, I thought I could have also entitled this message Fighting for Your Faith. But regardless of our lives or faith, I think we can identify that we are in a battle. We are in a war. And we will be fighting for our lives, fighting for our faith. I'd like to just reflect through the scripture once again. Thank Sister Bev for reading it so clearly. But I'd just like to read it again so that it can marinate a little more in our experience. Jacob was left alone. Did you hear that? He was left alone. Have you ever been left alone? I'm fearful of being alone. And in fact, while he was alone, they wrestled a man, someone with him. Wrestled all night. Bible didn't say when it started, but it's very clear they wrestled until daybreak. Until the breaking of them. When he saw that he prevailed not against him, when the man realized he wasn't uh, able to overcome Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then Jacob said, then the man said, let me go for the day breaker. And he said, I will not, Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, which means deceiver, but Israel, for as a prince, Hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed? And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Let us pray, God, as we open the scriptures, as we wait to hear a word from you. I invite you, God, to <clears throat> speak through me, speak by me. May it be you, uh, and may I just be a vessel. May all of us hear you this morning, helping us to fight for our lives and to fight for our faith is my prayer in your precious name. Amen. Jacob did not have a personal, a first person, personal, intimate relationship with God. Jacob's faith was a second person faith. And you perhaps wonder, what do I mean by he didn't have a first person personal intimate relationship, but instead a second person kind of faith? I'm talking about the kind of faith you had, perhaps, when you were growing up as a child and your parents took you to church. And you went to church not because you wanted to, but because your parents insisted that you did. You knew about God, not because you wanted to, but because your parents insisted that you learn more about God. So you, like Jacob, his was not a faith that he had directly in a relationship with God, but his was a faith that he had vicariously through his parents. He went to church because his parents took him. He had no personal prayer life. Jacob had no testimony. He grew up in a sheltered environment. Everything was provided. He didn't have to pay for food or even pray for food. Jacob was set and he knew it. 
In fact, God had he even promised Jacob the birthright blessing, even though it by culture should have gone to his firstborn twin, Esau, but Jacob, the secondborn of the twin, had been the one promised this special birthright blessing. So there was nothing in Jacob's life that he had to fight for, nothing that he had to pray for, nothing that he had to agonize for, nothing that challenged his growth relationship with God. So Jacob just lived life and his faith vicariously through the experience of his parents. I'm talking this morning about when life is good. And often when your life is going good and everything is going well, many times we don't have a urge to pray or everything is all right. Nothing that Jacob had experienced so far was driving him to hunger or thirst for an intimate, personal, first-person relationship with God. Nothing. And so I have come to understand that often we take our blessings for granted. Are you with me? We are having our wants and even our needs supplied. So we don't sense our desperate, urgent need for a personal, prayerful, committed relationship with God. We have never had a desperate need or a test that has driven us to our knees in prayer to seek after God with all our hearts. And here's an illustration. We treat God like he is Santa Claus. We sit in his lap. We smile for the camera. We collect our Christmas gift and then we run off to play with our gifts without another thought about what God had done. We love the gifts, but we have no time for the giver. That was Jacob's experience. He loved his life. He loved his blessings. He loved his parents. He loved all the wonderful gifts that God had bestowed on him, but he had no urgency to seek after God with all his heart. If, my friends, you have never had an experience that drives you to seek God, listen to me now. If you have never had that kind of a experience, I believe that for all of us, it is coming. For God doesn't want to be your Santa Claus. He wants to be your savior. A test or a mess in your life is coming. But I'm here to say to you this morning as well, that by faith you can know that when they come, God will turn your mess into a message, your test into a testimony, your trial into a trophy, your sorrow into joy, your weeping into laughter. He will turn your pain into peace and all your hurting into healing. That's what God will do. Let's go back into the story. Because God didn't want to be Jacob's Santa Claus, but instead he wanted to be Jacob's savior. God gave him a mini test, a little test, hoping that through this test, Jacob would have a testimony. 
You see, Jacob had been promised that the birthright would be his. But according to the culture of his time, and according to his dad, Isaac, he intended to give the birthright, not to Jacob, but to Esau. And so Jacob had a test. Should he connive? Should he deceive? Should he fight for in his own strength to gain this special blessing of a birthright? And I'm asking you, beloved, because I've had those experiences myself where there are times in our lives when somebody says something about you that hurts you. There are times in our lives when somebody does something to you that hurts you. There are times in our lives when things are not going exactly as we would want them to go. And when we experience those times, like Jacob was experiencing with this test, we want to deal with it by ourselves. If somebody says something about you that hurts you, well, I'm going to say something about them that is even worse than they said about me, to hurt them even worse than they hurt me. There are times in our lives when things are not going the way we would want them to go. And we would want to use our own wisdom, our own resources, our own finances, our own abilities to deal with those circumstances. It, it is as if we say, I'm going to put my faith and my Christianity over here for a while and I'm going to deal with this issue on my own. And that was the challenge that Jacob experienced. That was the test that was placed before him. How would he deal with this situation? His mother came to him and said, why don't you deceive your father? The last time you deceived someone. Perhaps you're saying, no, no, I don't do that. I'm a Christian. But here was Jacob, who should have known God, who grew up in the church, as it were, who was taken to Sabbath school, we could say, from he was a child. Here was Jacob with his mother, who brought him up in church. His mother, who took him to Pathfinders. His mother, who sang in the choir, being encouraged to be a deceiver of his father. But God wanted to allow Jacob to realize that you cannot put trust in yourself. You cannot put trust in your own resources. You cannot put trust in your own wisdom. We have to learn how to depend on God. And so out of this deception that Jacob, motivated by his mother, played on his father and on his older of the twin, Esau, Jacob was forced to run from home for over two decades, for over 20 years, he was away from home. Jacob's father died when he was away from home. His mother died when he was away from home. Jacob had no experience with the kind of a home life that he left then. He wandered away to live with an uncle 
who didn't serve God fully the way Jacob had learned to serve God. And while Jacob was there, his uncle attempted to deceive him and Jacob attempted to redeceive his uncle. So he found himself in a, a, a pit of deception where he and his uncle were trying to outdeceive each other. And after a while, Jacob realized that he had to leave. He realized that his relationship with his uncle had so deteriorated because Jacob, even with his uncle, hadn't learned fully how to trust in God. He was still attempting to use his own skills and intellect and resources and abilities to outdeceive others. He continued to fail. And so he decided to return home. And that's when God brought him to Peniel. And that's the experience of the text that we read in Genesis chapter 32, beginning in verse 24 to verse 30. That's the experience right there. Jacob was now at Peniel on his way back home. You get the impression that it was a journey perhaps of weeks or longer. But you get the impression that when he reached Peniel, he was very close to home. His brother, Esau, heard that Jacob was returning home. His brother, still angry after 20 years, decided that he was going to kill Jacob. What a homecoming. And I hope as you listen to this, you may be reflecting on your own life experiences and life stories of betrayal and hurt and brokenness in our families, in our churches, in all of our experiences, where many times we have decided we are going to take care of business in our own strength. God, you wait over here. But this attempt to take care of business in his own strength brought Jacob to Peniel. And the word Peniel refers to, in the Hebrew, the place where Jacob met God face to face. Face to face. After growing up in church, after Going to Pathfinders as a kid. After singing in the youth choir. After Sabbath school. After all of that. Jacob, like so many, left home. Left the church. Went on his own. Formed relationships without seeking God's blessings. Did things in his own strength. But finally, God brought him back to a place where face to face, God confronted Jacob about his life. Beloved, God is going to confront us and bring us to that place where we will finally have to make a decision of whether it is going to be God or it is going to be self whether we are going to lean on Jesus or we are going to depend on our own strength. But that's what Peniel is, that place where you meet God face to face, that place where you decide I'm going back in the world or I'm going forward with Jesus. I'm going back to my behavior in the past or I'm going to stand up with Jesus. What is your Peniel? Peniel. 
Peniel is a place where we meet God face to face for ourselves. Peniel is a place where our parents can't help us. Peniel is the place where those pat Sabbath school answers can't help us. Peniel is the place where the church and the preacher can't help us. This is the place where God will meet with you face to face in first person relationship where you will have to decide right then, right now, it is God or it is not God at all. The chorus said, that song many of you already know says that there's coming a time when we will have to decide it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. I am the one standing in the need of prayer. It ain't my mama who brought me up in church. This is not about my father. This ain't even about the preacher or the elder, but it's me, oh God. I am the one standing in the need of prayer. And so the question is today, are we spending enough quality and intimate time with God so that when he meets us in the hour of our need, so that when he meets us in our time of darkness, when he meets us face to face, we will know him. Because after growing up in church, after all of his Pathfinder years, after the Sabbath school was over, after prayer meeting had ended, after the preaching was done, after he had drifted out in the world, after he decided to come back home, Jacob still didn't know God. Is that your experience? God came to give Jacob a first-hand intimate experience and Jacob didn't know him. He thought it was an assailant. He thought perhaps a robber or maybe worst of all, one of his brothers, Esau's hired assassin. One of the Wagner group, perhaps fighting a hired warrior trying to take revenge for how Jacob had stolen Esau's birthright. And so all night, Jacob decided, I can't let this man kill me. I'm going to kill him instead. All night he wrestled. There was no place in that wrestling that began at whatever time it began. Maybe it was 10 o'clock that night. Maybe it was midnight. Maybe it was two o'clock in the morning, but all night until daybreak, as they wrestled together, there was no portion in the scripture that said, Jacob raised his hand and said, help me, oh God, even in a little desperate prayer. We recall when Peter stepped out of the boat and discovered after he took his eyes off Jesus that he was drowning Peter cried out, save me, oh Jesus. And you would have thought that if Jacob knew God enough, when the struggles start, when somebody comes up to hurt you and you're tempted to respond with worse hurt, when somebody tells a lie on you and you're tempted to lie back on them in return, when somebody betrays you and you're tempted to betray them in return, when somebody does something bad to you and you're tempted to do worse to them, you would have thought we would have fallen on our knees instead and said, God, help me. Help me. I need you in my moment of need right now. But many times, and perhaps you're not like me, maybe you are all little saints on your way to glory. But I know there are times in my own experiences when those things happen, the temptation is so strong and sometimes I yield to the temptation to respond in my flesh to how people respond and treat me. All night, Jacob wrestled. He had a personal wrestle mania trying to prove 
that he didn't need God. You see, wrestling is a sport where we enter into close combat with another to show that we are bigger and stronger and quicker than they are, that we can grip and throw, then pin the combatant to the canvas. I can take care of this on my own, for my strength is more than yours. My biceps are bigger than yours. I am quicker than you are. And so Jacob was in this wrestling. He thought he was in a physical conflict. Let me say that again. He thought he was in a physical conflict. Like how sometimes we think we are in a, a conflict. Maybe a verbal conflict. Maybe a, a conflict to say who is able to outdo the other person. And so all night he wrestled fighting for his life. But the more and the longer he wrestled that night, the more he realized that he couldn't overcome. And so his self-confidence then began to change to self-pity. And as he was wrestling and realizing that he was getting tired, as he tried to pin his assailant, this assassin, to the canvas, but the assassin was too quick and was moving so fast that Jacob was failing to grab hold of the assassin in the way he wanted to, to pin him to the canvas. And his strength began to wane and he realized this could be his life in self-pity. And I want you to notice this. It wasn't even intentional. It was just in self-pity. It wasn't even if Jacob said, you know what, I'm not going to win. So maybe, maybe I should ask God to help me. It wasn't as if he was intentional about it. Even if it is after the fact intentional about it. But while he was wrestling and he realized he was about to lose because he was getting tired, Jacob somehow from Sabbath school, somehow from Pathfinder, somehow from prayer meeting, Jacob heard himself saying, why me, Lord? Why am I the one out here wrestling in the night? What did I do to deserve this? But before I answer that, let me say God had a test for Jacob. God wanted Jacob to have a first-hand intimate experience with him. Jacob thought that that wrestling that night was only going to be temporary, that after a little while he would have overcome. He thought this wrestling was a little test that he could handle on his own. It's just a little sickness. I will go to the doctor. It was just an accident. I'll call my insurance. It's just another divorce. I'll just call my divorce lawyer or pull out my prenuptial. It's just a little misunderstanding. So I will handle it myself. But my friends, when we have wrestled with the problem all night. Have you ever wrestled with a problem all night? Have you ever gone to bed and you can't even sleep because the thing is on your mind and you're thinking about it all night? You're strategizing when daylight comes. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go into my boss and I'm going to tell them that that person who they plan to give the position to, even though I am the one who deserve it, I'm going to tell them what kind of person they are, and we are strategizing all night how we will handle the problem on our own. So when we have wrestled with a problem all night, all day, all week long, all month long, all year long, by ourselves, by ourselves, and nothing changed. In fact, it is getting worse because now we are tired of wrestling for so long. 
Now the final night is come and we are dreading that final night. You can't sleep. It's two o'clock. It's three o'clock. It's four o'clock. And you're still lying there wrestling with the problem. I'm here to tell you, beloved, rather than wrestle with the problem all night long, why don't you get up and pray? Cry out to God. Say, God, help me. Now the final night has come. Have you noticed how a toothache is always worse at night? A cough and a flu is always worse at night? Yes, sickness always seems worse at night. Our problems always seems worse at night. And so all night long, I'm sure you have had that illness. I'm sure you have had some time when you were so sick. Sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you've wrestled all night long with toss and turn and worry. And the problem only seemed to get worse. Daylight seems like it will never come. And then we go through that pity party. I return my tithe. So God should bless me. Why am I having this? But hear this. We can't pay God or bribe God for his blessings. It is not about telling God how we have never cussed or quarreled or even cheated on our spouse. How we have always been a good person, going to church, an upstanding person in our community. So God, how could you allow this thing to happen to me? We don't deserve God's favor just for being good. <laughs> Let me say that again. I'd say we do not deserve God's favor just because we have been good. Our goodness can never be good enough to deserve God's blessings and God's favor. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are we saved through faith. We are blessed, we are favored, not by works, for we would boast if we did it on our own. We would boast if we overcame on our own. We would boast if we won that wrestling match that night on our own. The next time somebody comes up against us, we would forget God because the last time we overcame in our own strength. So we can handle this next one. And so God doesn't want us to handle challenges and problems on our own. He wants us to trust him. And so here is what God is saying. All night you wrestled with yourself thinking you can handle it. Thinking in your own flesh you can handle it. By your own smarts you can handle it. With your own money you can handle it. Through your own lawyer or doctor you can handle it. With your degrees you can handle it. God says I just stopped by before daybreak. Just when you realize you are failing to handle it just when it's getting worse, just when it's spiraling out of control, when you are now most desperate. I stop by to tell you, you can't handle it, but I can. Yes, I can. Jacob, and you could put your name here now. Jean, Bev. <laughs> You could put you here now, Sherry, Bancroft, Carol, Marsha. You could put you, your name here now, Amy. You could put you here, your name here. The text says, like God would have told Jacob, like God is telling me, Errol, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. And so when you think you're wrestling against a neighbor or you're wrestling against that church brother or that church sister or that family member or that spouse or that sibling, what you're doing instead, the Bible says we're actually wrestling against the devil himself. No wonder we can't overcome. I bet you thought it was just an accident. I bet you thought it was just your spouse provoking you. Or it was just your co-worker flirting with you. Or your neighbor who didn't like you. No, it's more than that. It's the devil trying to tempt you. He sees that we are not really into God the way we should be. He knows 
We are not really holding on to God the way we should. We come to church, but we only know God vicariously through somebody else's study, somebody else's sermon. We pray, but it is more like the kind of prayer that says, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Nice sounding, but they come from our lips, not from our hearts. We even say happy Sabbath, but we are not happy in the Lord. But I want you to know today, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that what the devil meant for harm, God can turn into good. Somebody say hallelujah. What the devil meant for harm, God can turn into good. For when we are tempted to let go, God will move us to hold on. Let me say that again. When we are tempted to let go, God will so orchestrate all of what he's doing in our lives to have a relationship with us that we will now feel inclined to hold on. That's why he sends a test in our lives. That's why he sends some trial sometimes because when things are going well, many times we want to let go, but when we are challenged, when we are in problems and we realize we can't deal with it by ourselves, then we are inclined. God, I'm going to hold. Was afraid. He was discouraged. Life hadn't gone the way he wanted it to go. His brother wanted to kill him. He was indeed now between a rock and a hard place. He was tired that night. He lay down to sleep, but he couldn't sleep. God wouldn't let him sleep. It was time for a face-to-face -face interaction with God. And I'm here to tell you, it's not that God wants to bring us sickness, says, or accidents, or pain, or broken relationships, or financial disasters, or emotional trauma, or any major or even minor annoyances. God could block them, but he allows them. Watch this, watch this now. He allows them for our good. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. He knows perhaps that we love him, but we don't love him enough. He is maybe number two or number three or even number four in our lives. He knows we pray, but we don't pray enough. For we are not desperate enough. He knows the level of our relationship, that it is platonic and a surface relationship. It is not close enough, not warm enough, not intimate enough, not passionate enough. And so here is it now, beloved. Here is it now, watch this. God therefore allows us to experience some trauma, some tragedy some sickness, some pain, a situation, so he can break us and then remold us. Sometimes that will cause us to be desperate. Something, sorry, that will cause us to be desperate for God. Something that may even kill us, kill our pride, kill our self-centeredness, to kill us so he can resurrect us as a new cre creation in Jesus Christ. So he can bring us to the place in Jeremiah 29 verse 13. And you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your hearts. And so that's what God will do when he sends these trials. When he sends these tests. When he sends this problem and in the midnight hour we can't sleep and we are wrestling with the problem. For God is trying to say to us, stop wrestling with the problem and turn to me because I can take care of that problem for you. And so that night, Jacob was desperate, tossing and turning, fighting with his demons and his fears. God came down, tapped him gently on the shoulders to talk to him, mano y mano. Man to man, face to face. But Jacob jumped up, scared and frightened in the dark, fighting 
with the stranger for his very life. Jacob didn't know this was God, for Jacob didn't really know God. All night long, he was wrestling and fighting. Now get this, Jacob was fighting against his conviction. For as he fought, his conscience was bothering him. He knew he had not really followed God. That's why he had deceived his own father and his brother for the birthright. He then deceived his uncle for his wealth. Could this be his brother or his uncle or his brother in brothers in law or a paid assassin coming for revenge? Jacob wrestled manfully. His work out in the fields, caring for Laban's herd, had toned and strengthened his muscles. He had wrestled with wild animals. He had wrestled with many robbers to protect the flock. Surely he could overthrow this one person with one of his cunning deceptive tricks. First, he went for a quick headlock to be followed by grabbing the feet so he could throw and pin the assailant to the ground in submission. But he found himself instead the one who was headlocked and pinned to the ground in submission. But the assailant backed off. Jacob jumped, jumped up, tried again. He feigned a cunning headshot. He went in for the kill, hoping to land some serious body blow to be followed by a dangerous uppercut. But again, even in the dark, his opponent was able to efficiently counter every move. All night long, Jacob wrestled and fought with his opponent. He had tried everything, but nothing worked. It was now almost daybreak. His opponent had gotten the best of him. Jacob was out of options. He was exhausted. He began to wonder why his opponent didn't just kill him. Why was he toying with him all night? It was then that Jacob realized his opponent wasn't a paid assassin. He did not want to kill him. He seemed to be actually trying to not hurt him, but instead to save him. It began to dawn on Jacob. This was no earthly opponent. This must be God himself. When Jacob realized that this is God, not man, his wrestling for mastery gave way to clinging and desperately praying for a blessing. When is it that we will stop wrestling and start clinging and start grabbing and start holding on to God? This time, the being who had so skillfully sidestepped all of Jacob's lunges and punches and uppercut now couldn't escape Jacob's desperate clinging and holding and praying at daybreak knowing that at daybreak he had to face his brother, knowing that at daybreak the problems was going to come back, knowing that at daybreak the devil was waiting for him. Jacob now in desperation clung on, hung on to God. Praying and begging and pleading for mercy, for grace, for healing, for help, for hope, for rescue, and for salvation. In the dark that night, Jacob came face to face with God. Out of his experience, Jacob now knew he could trust God. So now in the early hours in the morning, instead of fighting with God, he began praying to God, pleading to God, submitting to God. He just wouldn't let God go. He God says, let me go. Jacob says, I will not let you go except you bless me. Is that your prayer this morning? Is that your prayer today? Is that your prayer this Sabbath? That you will not let God go regardless of what you face for you want God to bless you. That new morning, as I get ready to close, that new Jacob, that morning, is who God wants us to be. The past of being a Christian in name only is over. The past of having just a form of godliness but having no power is over. The night of fighting against God is over. The night of fear and torment is over. The morning has come and now we are clinging to God. Desperately, desperately seeking for intimacy, 
desperately praying and pleading and begging for grace and favor on our lives. Today, right now, we are praying, saying, God, we will not let you, let you go till you bless us, not let you go till you heal us, not let you go till you free us, not let you go till you give us peace, not let you go till you strengthen us, not let you go till you forgive us, not let you go till you provide for us, not let you go till you change us. We are going to keep on praying and pleading and begging. Lord, we will not let you go till you pour the Holy Spirit on us. Lord, we will not let you go till you kill us and then resurrect us. Lord, we will not let you go till you save us. Beloved, are you ready for that this morning? If that's where you are, then we can close this morning. I pray that that's where you are. And desperate in your heart, you're saying right now, God, help me not to let you go. After this, we can all then say with the gospel song, I've been changed, healed, free, delivered. I found grace, joy, peace, and favor. And right now is the moment. Today is the day. I've been changed. Have you been changed? I've been changed. I'm asking you, have you been changed? I have waited. Have you waited for this moment to come? And I won't let it pass me by. I won't go back, can't go back to the way it used to be before we came face to face to God and his presence came and changed us. All our shame, all our guilt and sin, they have been forgiven. No more change, no more fear. All past is over. I won't go back. We can't go back to the way it used to be before. God's presence came and changed me. By the grace of God, I hope it changed you. May God bless you today. Amen. Amen.